Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the classic and probably most popular instrument approach, the ILS approach. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we're doing and kind of walk you through the individual steps. Uh, first things first, uh, we're going to be flying in to Bradley International Airport, that's Kilo Bravo Delta Lima. This plate here is going to give us all the critical information we need to know. So first things first, we're coming from Barnes Air Force Base. This is actually has a nice little tack in here. We're going to be traveling around the 121 radial from that particular place, crossing this intersection, which is going to be our initial approach fix known as Kibby, which will be 12.5 nautical miles away from our destination. When we get to Kibby, because we have this solid black racetrack pattern, we're going to have to do what they call a procedure turn. Now in this case, it's a little tricky because these turns are left-handed turns which means for those of you familiar with hold entries, which we'll do a video on a little later on, this gets a little tricky, so we have to actually be really, really cautious with this. So we're actually going to cross the waypoint, turn left, and then actually do what they call a teardrop entry to spin ourselves around, reline up with 238, and then fly the ILS down to the ground. Uh, the reason we know it's a teardrop entry is if I come over here, this is a POH Performance, by the way, a pretty cool website. You can see I'm coming from this direction. I'm gonna cross that Kibby point, and since it's heading as 238, and since it's a left turn, like I said, we're gonna be following this funky little teardrop pattern to reacquire the radial we need to land. Now, other critical information we're gonna to need to know, just scrolling down real quickly. I can see since we're type A aircraft, our minimums are gonna be 370 feet. Note, ILSs can be flown as localizer approaches. You just press the nav instead of the APR button, basically. But the minimums are going to go up, so you want to be very cautious with that. You'll also notice at this particular airport, there's actually two different sets of minimums depending on what your initial fix is. If you're actually coming from the inside fix, and this is a much more dangerous approach, which is going to be this one right here, you actually have better minimums because you're so much closer to the airport. So we need to be at 3,000 feet by the time we cross Kitty, which we'll be at. And now it's simply a matter of cruising on over and getting our frequency set up into the simulator itself. So let's go ahead and do that now. So the first frequency we're going to need to set is we're going to need to set our initial ILS heading, our initial ILS frequency. So I'm going to come over here. This is going to be my top GPS. We don't need to look at what it actually says. I'm going to set this to 111.10. You can get that number off of the top left corner of the approach plate. Notice I already have glide slope information. I'm now going to go ahead and set this to the runway we're landing on, which is going to be an approach heading of 238, which you can also get off the approach plate at the top left corner. Now on the bottom one, I'm actually going to set it to the VOR that we're currently using. So if you remember, we're going to be taking the 121 radial off of that particular VOR. Set that right there, looks good. Come down to this one, I'm going to go ahead and dial that in now. The frequency is 113.0. Swap it. And it should take just a minute. Now you're probably going, why is that giving you so much trouble right now? Well, the reason is, is the fact that I'm so close to the VR station, it's literally right below us. So it's not going to give us good information right away. Go ahead and get ourselves set up on the 121 here. Looks pretty good right there. Make sure my power is set correctly. Set my mixture correctly. Looks good, looks good. I mean, quite that little, about 2400 RPM. And other than that, everything's looking like it's in really, really good shape. Let's go ahead and do it. So we're gonna know that we cross that waypoint when this needle is still centered and this needle centers on its position, seeing that we crossed it. The moment we do that, we're simply gonna bring ourselves to about 60 degrees, take about a minute of time doing our teardrop entry and then come whipping around on the other side. All right, let's go ahead and do it. All right, let's do it to it. Now we're gonna hold this heading for just a moment here. The reason being is what we're trying to do is get away from the, end, the tack hand, which literally we just flew over seconds ago. So it's gonna be a little sensitive. So I'm actually just gonna be flying on a constant heading at this point as we kind of cruise away. All right, so my power is set correctly. And the autopilot's taking me up and down a little bit, which, yeah, nothing unusual there. Drop down my uh, altitude. Looks pretty good. We're just a teeny tiny bit high, but I'm not too worried about that just yet. Again, one of the wonderful reasons why people love ILS approaches is the fact you get both up and down and left and right. Our up and down in this case is going to be marked by this bar. It's simply telling us that we're very low at the moment. This bar here is our up and down. 
So what I'm actually gonna do is flip my CDI to VLOC mode, which means instead of using the GPS to feed this information, I'm now using the actual ILS in Localizer to feed this information. Very important we don't make that mistake. Again, you're looking for nav, nav, and nav. Otherwise, we'd be in a lot of hurt. Some GPS systems actually have the ability to swap automatically. I'm not gonna test that theory on this one. I just figure it's a little bit easier. Okay, so we're proceeding up fairly well here. I look directly below me, make sure everything looks okay. Yeah, it's pretty nasty weather indeed. So what we're waiting for now is now this needle to suddenly swing. Go ahead and check my frequencies real quick. We should be on the 121, which we are. And we're ever so slightly off to the left. So if we wanted to actually get a little bit closer to that waypoint, we could bring our aircraft to the left as well. Just trying to reacquire. Again, we're basically trying to triangulate this position as well as this position simultaneously. So we're going to come to the left a little bit. This needle will start swinging in just a moment. Again, we've got no actual guidance as far as what's down there. I think I saw a little bit of the ground a minute ago. So we're going at this almost completely blind. Looking pretty good so far. This needle is going to start hiking towards the center in about just a moment. Beautiful. So now we're back on course. As soon as this needle centers, again, that means I'm back on the correct radial. When this centers and this is centered, like I said, we're going to be crossing Kibbe intersection. Actually, I'm going to bring myself a little bit more aggressively over. Now, one of the reasons I chose to take the 172 out for this exercise is because it's better to actually see this in action when you can't have that nice digital display kind of telling you where you are on the ground, just to give you an idea of how incredibly accurate this technology is. All right, see how that's just about centered? And I'm going to go ahead and bring myself back to the correct heading. So now we are on the 121 radial from Barnes Air Force Base. This is the 113.0. Once we've gotten this one, we simply proceed along this one for a little while until we cross the Kibi intersection, which is going to be indicated by this needle centering. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, pause for just a second, look out the window. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that looks more like instrument conditions to me. Much better. All right, let's go ahead and take a quick little look at what we're doing right now. So if you want to think about it visually, I just crossed this river. I'm doing this, just like my mouse is going to show. Again, when those needles cross, we're going to go straight at about a 30 degree offset, turn around, and then line ourselves up for that nice landing. All right, one thing I am noticing just sitting here in the aircraft is the fact that the glide slope bar, which is this one right here, is slowly starting to hike downwards. That doesn't surprise me on account of the fact that we are getting closer to the correct altitude. Remember, we're 100 feet too high right now. So as a result, that's going to be part of the reason why we seem to be off just a teeny tiny bit. So just a little bit more power here. We're pretty much perfectly centered. If anything, we actually need to come to the right just a tiny bit in order to get this a little bit closer. Remember, the more centered these two needles are, the closer to that actual waypoint that we're actually triangulating. One thing that kind of bums me about this aircraft is how we don't have a DME display easy on this particular one. We do have it down here on the GPS itself. Like you can see, I'm uh, 12 nautical miles away from the end of the airport, but we don't have that at the lower display, which is kind of a bummer because it means we have to work a little bit harder for some of these types of approaches. But if it weren't hard, we wouldn't be doing it, right? Okay, in moments, and I mean moments, you're going to suddenly see this needle go whirr, and go shoot straight to the right as we cross the actual localizer. The moment we do that, we're going to make our heading about 60 degrees, which is going to give us a nice teardrop entry. We'll hold it for about a minute, then we'll go all the way around, line ourselves up for our landing, and put ourselves down on the ground. Again, if you want a kind of a visual, I'll flip it on just for a moment on the GPS. You can see just how incredibly close we are to actually being where we're supposed to be without the actual GPS information. And again, that just comes from experience and uh, you know having good weather. <laughs> That's a big one. Okay, so just a moment. This needle's going to go and go shooting by. The moment we cross it, we'll have crossed Kibby, and then we're going to take that left turn for our procedure turn. So again, double check my frequencies real quick. Well, 111.0, that's set correctly. Or 113, it's a good idea to identify these things. I notice that my identification here says I am a Y. There it goes, right? Stand by to cross Kibby, stand by. Watch how close we were. Ready, set. Bam. And we're a little to the north, but that's all right. Okay, we're now going to bring ourselves to a heading of 60 degrees, and we're going to do our teardrop entry. So what we're doing here is we're essentially going out 
kind of arcing around, and then we're going to arc all the way back around and reacquire where we originally needed to be moments later. Okay, now you want to start your timer. Now I'm sitting there with the timer. I also have one on my watch in front of me. It makes it a little easier for me. All right, we're gonna proceed in this direction for about a minute, and then we're gonna go ahead and do the rest of our reversal. So remember, our ultimate goal is to hit two, three, eight, which means if we go at 300 degrees, we'll be pointing towards it. So when we take our left turn to reacquire what we need to do, we're gonna point at the 30 until this needle recenters. Then you know we're ready to go ahead and land the aircraft. Then it's simply a matter of just making sure everything's ready to go, you know, our gas is set correctly, our undercarriage, all that other good stuff is ready. Watching my clock carefully here, we have 27 seconds before we have to take our left turn. Watching carefully, careful. Again, this is just a one minute procedure. If you wanna see it visually real quick, we're simply going like this right now. All right, get ready. And six, three, two, one. Make our heading three zero zero degrees. So now we're turning left. This is the teardrop part of the entry pattern. So what we're gonna do is as we take this left turn in just a few moments, we're gonna reacquire the localizer. That's gonna be this one right here. And then we simply go ahead and ask the aircraft to uh, go into approach mode. And you can see we flow almost an offset. Look at how quickly this is coming into position. So I'm actually gonna arm the approach by pressing the APR button. Now the aircraft is going to start flying the approach autonomously. Now, one thing I did notice is we got to that a little on the soon side, which bothers me. Simply means instead of going 60 degrees, we probably should have gone closer to 30 degrees. So that was a bad on my part. So now the aircraft is automatically landing the airplane. Now, this is really, really, really cool. Because basically what's going to happen is this localizer will center in just a moment. When it does, we should be facing about 238, depending on what the crosswind is. Now we're actually gonna hold this 3,100 feet altitude until this needle gets to this line here. When that happens, if you have approach mode on, which you can see is armed down there, the aircraft will automatically climb to it and then start following it all the way down to the ground. So at this point, we've got our work basically cut out for ourselves. Let's start thinking about our minimums, but I'm not gonna do that yet until I know I've captured the glide slope side of things. If you wanna look at this in 2D real quick, let me go ahead and swap over here fast so you can take a look. So right now, we're basically just cross Kibby, and I can tell we cross Kibby. Actually, we're not quite to Kibby. Kibby is gonna be in just a moment. We're actually right about here. I can tell this by looking at my DME real fast. We're gonna to go to Kibby. We're gonna start descending and we're gonna get down to 2,700 feet. We're gonna capture the glide slope right around here at Searle intersection. It's gonna be about 10.2 nautical miles away from our destination. Then what's gonna happen is we're just gonna slowly descend all the way down and the aircraft is gonna put itself on the ground. While we're starting our descent process, of course, like I said, we're gonna start thinking about the missed approach and we'll get that all nice and neatly set up for ourselves once we get there moments later. But other than that, it's just kind of a matter of relaxing. You can fly an ILS approach by hand, by the way. Uh, keep in mind, certain types of ILS approaches have different categories. You've probably heard of category one, two, three. Different categories simply indicate what level automation or minimums you're gonna be dealing with. At the most dangerous category of ILS approaches, they actually expect the aircraft to basically land itself. You have to have a special air crew for it, and you have to have a special automatic pilot. Usually it's a dual channel kind of deal in order to make sure that you do that safely. Okay, let's take a look at things. So we just crossed 12 nautical miles. If we were actually to take a look at this real fast, you'll see I've just crossed the Kibi intersection, which is exactly what we expected it to be. I don't expect to see this needle start to move until we get to about Searle intersection. Now, technically, we're supposed to be at 2,100 feet when we cross the Motel intersection. So if we wanted to kind of catch this so it's not so steep of an approach, we could actually begin a very, very gentle glide almost immediately, which we'll go ahead and set up doing now. Set this down to our new desired altitude, which is going to be 2,100 feet. And we're just going to go ahead and press down a few times. And there we go. Keep in mind, approach is still armed at this point. Come on. There it goes. Sorry, passengers' ears. We can see I'm 11 nautical miles away. My next waypoint is Searle intersection, which is going to be 10.2 nautical miles away. We've actually just broken our minimum. We're supposed to be at 2,700 feet.
All right. And what's our next minimum? It's going to be motel intersection. Motel intersection, we should be 5.5 nautical miles away, which will be indicated here from our DME. And we should be at an altitude of 2,100 feet. Taking a look, we're definitely going to be at 2,100 feet, but we did just break minimums. Looking out the window real quick, uh, we definitely just broke minimums. Now, being from this part of the world, I always like to play the have I been there game, but uh, to be honest, it's all looking pretty pretty foggy and pretty hazy for me right now, so I'm not 100% sure. All right, probably a good time to start thinking about preparing the aircraft for landing. We'll do gas, undercarriage, mixture, propeller, flaps, light, speed. Okay, I'm all set. <laughs> so now it's just a matter of putting this thing down on the ground. We'll start slowing down and putting flaps down when we get a little bit closer. Now the interesting thing here is it's not nearly as much turbulence as you probably could experience in this particular type of situation. Usually you're getting bounced around pretty bad if your visibility looks like this outside. Now interesting thing, oh yeah, it's got the little vent and everything. I love that. Okay, our altitude is uh, still a little high, which is actually a little bothersome because I asked the aircraft for this much and it's decided to give me that much. Okay, I see how it is. Okay, notice my glide slope bar has just come to life. What's going to happen now, since we've armed the approach, the moment this needle crosses here, the aircraft is going to go burn and go shooting straight up. We shouldn't really see this hit neutral until this says 5.5 nautical miles away. Again, if you want to wonder how I can know that, you can see that we're basically sitting here at 2,100 feet, even though we're supposed to be at 27. I'm being very naughty. And when we hit this, that will be the time to start our actual descent going down. All right, we're doing pretty well. There's our first bar. Just a moment, and the aircraft should go and start getting all sorts of silly on us. All right, stand by. Distance should be right around, I believe it's 5.5. Remember, we're a little high. All right, make sure the approach is captured. Down we go. All right, let's land the plane. Did we cross that at 5.5? Ah, we're a little far away for it to catch, but that's not unusual. Okay, so now this is how the ILS works. This needle will show us how far to the left or right we are. In this case, we're perfect. This needle now shows us how far up or down we are. In this case, we're just a millimeter high. Go ahead and reduce my power just a little bit. Now remember, it's a three degree descent, which simply means if I'm doing 100 knots, I expect to be doing 500 feet per minute. The two should line up and agree with each other. For me, oh, well, now we're starting to get the turbulence. I was wondering when I was gonna hit that. I'm gonna go ahead and put down my first notch of flaps. Get my power somewhat stabilized. I already see the runway, but again, I'm just going to take it all the way down. Now that we know that the approach autopilot is ready to go, I'm going to start setting up everything for my missed approach procedure. Uh, normally, of course, if we had some sort of way of marking where our final altitude is, we'd actually go ahead and mark it now. There's a lot of these little red bars that you could stick on here, or if we had a radar altimeter, we could use that well. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and get everything ready. We're supposed to climb to 4,000 feet. And we're also supposed to proceed direct, let's see here, proceed direct to Hartford VOR, that's 114.90. All right, everything's ready to go for missed approach. So for whatever reason, when we get to the bottom of all this and we still can't see the end of the runway, that's going to be a pretty good time to go ahead and uh, literally just give it full power, take off and proceed directly over to Hartford VOR. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually put Hartford VOR down here. For example, if I want to do something like this, now we can sit here and uh, carefully crank this thing so when we take back off and start running, we have this thing all ready to go for us and we know exactly which direction we need to turn the aircraft in order to get there safely. All right, time to start getting ready for landing. I'm going to go ahead and put down my other notch of flaps. Good to go. We need about 65 knots. I see the runway ahead of me, which means uh, we're going to have a successful landing. I notice that left and right, I'm perfect. Up and down, I'm absolutely perfect as well. Again, that's the nice thing about having an autopilot. Flying these things by hand in turbulence is uh, definitely an experience for those of you who have not tried it. But again, this is just for the purposes of demonstration. Now, if you're using an airliner, this procedure is exactly the same. Usually your minimums are a little bit different. And obviously, make sure you have your landing gear down. I can't emphasize that enough for folks. I've uh, made that mistake a few times. Fortunately, I've never made it in the real world, or I probably wouldn't be really a good person to be explaining these things to. <laughs> All right, get our speed down about 65 knots. Do my gumfuls checks one more time. Everything looks good. Yeah, we're good to go. 
We just broke out of the clouds. I can see the end of the runway looking directly ahead of me. Again, just to demonstrate what this looks like when it doesn't look right, I'm gonna go ahead and disengage the autopilot. I'm gonna pull up for just a minute. I want you to see, yeah. Do you see how that bar shoots downwards? Now I'm gonna go ahead and point my nose down. I want you to see that bar go too far the other way. Bingo. Do you see how it suddenly shot in the other direction? Having it just right is a matter of finding just the right amount to go ahead and hold the aircraft at so that that bar stays nice and neutral. And flying these by hand, especially in an airliner, is a heck of an experience if you've never tried it. There we go. Now we're back lined up. Now, it's something really important that you'll see on approach plates all the time. They'll say something along the lines like glide slope and VGSI are not coincident. What that simply means is for those of you who are familiar with those bright lights on the side of the runway, like a Vassi or Pappy, they aren't necessarily lined up with each other. So as a result, if you try to start following the lights, you actually go ahead and come off of the glide slope that you're supposed to be following down to the ground. It's an interesting problem that exists in some airports. Also keep in mind, an ILS has to be accurate enough to pretty much get you all the way down to the ground. That differs quite a bit from other types of approaches, such as the localizer approach, I should say the LDA approach, which is an ILS approach, but it's not lined up with the runway. So it's very interesting to see the two differences there. All right, I just noticed that my middle marker went off. No surprise, I'm one nautical mile away from the end of the runway. Getting bounced around pretty good here, but this is nothing bad at all. Now the interesting thing is because I'm in a little propeller airplane as opposed to a big airliner, the touchdown point is actually those gigantic white, uh, I should say, yeah, giant white rectangles, I guess is the way to describe it, that are sitting there a little ways down the runway. I don't need to land on those if I can visually land on the big numbers at the end of the runway. But technically, when you actually touch down, you should be hitting that spot. And again, that's where the ILS will actually have you lined up during your actual landing. But for me, I'm actually going to disregard the ILS and go ahead and stick us right on the big old number 24 down there at the bottom. Notice we've done this entire approach without the benefit of a GPS. There's my inner marker. That usually tells me, look out the window, is it time to land? I think it is. It's one thing I like about Cessna 172, you could just kill the throttle and basically glide it in. Tower picked up a little bit too much speed. We're going to put that back wheel down first. And we are here. So that's all there really is to an ILS approach. Keep in mind, if we did have to do a missed approach, we could actually fly the ILS backwards, and this is called a back course. For those of you who have the button for it, you have a little button that says the word BC, and it would literally it would basically reverse sense an ILS, so we could go take back up into the air and come back around again. Hopefully this is video is helpful. Like I said, the ILS is one of the most common approaches that you're probably going to use, because it's just so easy to use. And again, even in an aircraft like this, we can have a lot of luck with it. Enjoy.